Welcome to episode number 26 with Ron Werner, expert in developing the next generation of cybersecurity leaders. Homework begins once you finish school. And the other is the real test isn't in the classroom, but out there in the real world. You know, when your boss asks you a question, you can't say, oh, excuse me, let me look up my answer in the book. It's you better be ready with an answer uh, and an intelligent answer and one that fits the needs of your organization. That is a huge point, and I'm glad you made it because when I got my black belt, it was interesting. I was trained by a, a gentleman from Korea who was so highly ranked as a black belt himself. He was probably in his 60s at the time, and he had to go back to Korea to, to find someone that was high enough to actually test him, like he couldn't be tested in the U.S. And he often said, you begin, your training begins when you get your black belt, and there's nine levels beyond that. So it's an interesting point that you made up is that we need a point of entry into the profession, but then it is without a doubt doesn't end. And there's multiple layers to this that lasts a lifetime. So that's a, an interesting point, Bill. Maybe we need some type of a, a ranking system within cybersecurity. You know, as a black belt in cybersecurity, it still shows that I have a long way to go because there's the different levels. But you, know, you start out, what do you start out with a white belt? And then... Yeah, it is that way, Ron. And and what's interesting, and I find it fascinating, the gaming piece, I keep coming back to that because what it sets up is very interesting because even within my soccer team, I coach, I coach a travel soccer team that is an A team, but also we have a B team. And then we also have recreation. We have different levels of recreation. So we can accommodate a girl soccer player at any level. And, and of course, boys as well. But the interesting piece is there's a those that are most skilled and are most deeply attuned to wanting to progress in that sport, it, there's a channel for them. And, and I think it was funny. I was just on, again, one of the sites that linked off of your, of your writing. It was essentially, it looked like the NCAA basketball bracket for cybersecurity competitions. And I was like, this is great. Hello, and you are listening to Bill Murphy's Red Zone podcast. If you are listening for the first time, I interview leaders who inspire me in the areas of hardcore IT security, IT business leadership, innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship, and fearless living principles. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to the show, everybody. This is Bill Murphy, your host of the Red Zone podcast. Today, I interviewed Ron Werner. Ron is an expert at what it takes to develop the next generation of cybersecurity leaders. He won the, at the Air Force Association U.S. Cyber Patriot Mentor of the Year in 2013-14 for his work with high school cybersecurity competitions. And we're going to get into this discussion about cybersecurity competitions here shortly. He's also the Director of Cybersecurity Studies at Bellevue University, and he has over 25 years of corporate and military experience in IT and security. Ron's experience is very hands-on, and he loves to teach, and he loves to bring this real practical background all the way into the classroom, which I really admire. So if you're a CIO, or a CISO and want to build a better security team, or if you're just a parent who wants to broaden your perspective and understanding of what is going on relative to your kids, you're going to enjoy the conversation we have. Also, Ron publishes his work on CSO online, and I put references that in the show notes to a couple articles you may want to read for your children, because there's about four there that are, that are excellent as far as uh, teaching kids. And there's team competitions, which is really important concept that we discussed about how we can develop a competitive landscape for children in, in a safe way, where we have multiple levels of team competition across several organizations, but it's developing into a way which kids, both from the middle school all the way up to the college level and beyond, can enter team competitions to try to better their skills and really become world class, or at least national class, or at least local class. So whether or not you're going to go into law enforcement locally, or go into CIA, FBI, or whether you're going to work for an organization, being able to better your skills beyond book knowledge is critical. And so Ron goes into that and shares his philosophies about that. So 
With that, I hope you really enjoy this program and all of the show notes and links are on my website at redzonetech.net forward slash podcasts. Again, that's redzonetech.net forward slash podcasts. Or you can go to LinkedIn and you can read all the show notes and summaries on LinkedIn as well. So enjoy the program. Glad to be here and I appreciate you having me, Bill. So I know there's a couple of different ways we can go here. And I'm fascinated with your approach to teaching kids about cybersecurity skills. And maybe we could start there and then we could talk about teaching employees uh, cybersecurity skills. What is your take about the cybersecurity education within our school system at this point? We have a lot of room for improvement. Uh, Talking with educators, K through 12, and then college level throughout the United States and even the world, we see that there's a lot of disparity about what's being taught. There's not a common curriculum, not a common direction, particularly at the public school level. The teachers teach what they are familiar with, and often that's not very much about cybersecurity. They'll focus on common computer science topics like application development, programming, basic computer science flow type, not addressing systems and network administration, security, or other business level computing issues. So the idea is to try to fill in that gap and to help out the teachers uh, in developing a, a better computer science, cybersecurity, and IT curriculum. What would be the elements? This is interesting because... We had Raymond, uh, he's the CTO of Trend Micro on a few weeks ago, and he thought one of the big issues was basically the kids can know how to use the technology objects, but weren't being trained on the mechanics under the hood. Exactly. They know how to use their iPhones and Androids, but they don't know what it takes to communicate and how to troubleshoot. A common question I like to ask, and so for all of your listeners, please take out your personal computer meaning your smartphone, uh, and look at it and think to yourself, how many different ways does it have of communicating? It's a common question I like to ask folks. There's actually two different ways you can look at it. One is at the application layer, which is, okay, I can use Skype, I can use email, IM, SMS, Twitter, Snapchat, etc. But then there's the other element of the technologies, such as most smartphones have Bluetooth, have 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, uh, GPS, as well as the common input and outputs. Well, a lot of people, both the students at the younger levels and even adults, don't realize all the different ways we have of communicating through the technology. And each of those ways is a potentially an avenue and a threat vector to infiltrate into our data, our private information, our company systems. So it's being able to educate on how the technology works at a systems and network administration layer that we're looking to do across the spectrum. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Where would you feel this falls in and where do you do you think this is covered in our curriculum today? Because I, I think, so I was talking to my kids recently about, I tell them, draw me a picture of how, how the phone works with, within our house. And I said, draw it. And they said, well, it just communicates through Wi-Fi. And when I broke it down and, and explained how there was a, a channel, the antenna talks through a channel called cellular, and we can run data and voice over cellular, and then we can run data and voice over our Wi-Fi connections. And I started drawing it visually. It made a huge impact that that the phone was actually a very uh, sophisticated device that had multiple channels of communication options. But that's still not teaching them, you know, the mechanics of it. It's just showing them from an architecture how it's working. So where would you go with educating students in regards to that, that question about asking someone, how does your phone work? I usually dive into IP addressing at that point and then actually equates nicely to a home address, I explain. Okay, our home address, and this is the number of our street, and then we have our street, we have the city, which leads into subnetting and being able to explain, okay, we want to, for the post office, we create a subnet because you don't want to make have carry everybody's mail for the whole city throughout the whole city. No, you just carry what's available for that neighborhood. Same idea with IP and subnetting. Well, plus on the internet today, we still use network address translation or NAT uh, because with IP version 4, we don't have enough IP addresses, particularly with the internet of things. 
Granted, it's changing with IP version 6. One of the ways I use to really connect with the kids uh, is using Minecraft. If you talk with kids of any age up to 18 or so, they've all played Minecraft and are familiar with it. It's an awesome learning tool. Well, I ask, how do you connect with your friends on Minecraft? How do you get it so you're all playing in the same server, the same area? Have you ever wanted to create your own server? A lot of the kids then can identify with that. We've had to talk through how do we open up firewall ports to allow communication in, to allow your friends to play on your own Minecraft server. That's a great way to teach security at a level that the kids can identify with very quickly. Yeah, and Minecraft is such a, an amazing game. I, maybe I'm jumping topics a little bit, but do you feel like gaming might be the gateway into getting kids involved in cybersecurity? Oh, definitely. And not just kids. I let the kids know that now I'm middle-aged, but I started out as a gamer 40, you know, 35 years ago. And this was back in the old days where you had your copy of Byte and you had to program in your own games. Taught me how to program. So similarly with the kids, it's a great way to connect with them, the idea of gamification uh, and making learning fun. That's where these competitions come into play, where it adds that element of fun into the learning, where the kids are given safe environments to be curious. One of the things I do, Bill, is I like to promote the idea of hacking. Uh, and hacking sometimes makes folks nervous. I don't know if you've encountered that. But it's like, oh, you're, you're teaching them the dark side. And it's like, no, they're already doing a lot of this hacking. Just are they doing it with any direction? And quite often they're not. I've known kids to go after their school's network just because they're curious, just because it's there. Not really with any malicious intent. They're just trying to see what they can see. Uh, so being able to work with them and direct them. And again, whether we're talking about high school kids or employees, uh, it's being able to show them the value of educating themselves, but in a safe environment, as exactly the, what we're looking to do uh, in all of cybersecurity education. Well, I think you're onto something with the gaming piece. I was uh, looking at some fascinating research with uh, Jane McGonigal recently, just wrote a book called Super Better, and she has several TED Talks. Have you heard of Jane McGonigal? Yes. Yeah, I love her stuff. So when in kind of diving into that a bit, into the gaming piece, I think a lot of people are still under the impression that gaming, too much gaming on, on a computer is can be bad and that it's not good for kids and they should be taking out a book and reading a book. Or And I'm not suggesting that the books are bad, but the, actually the research is showing that the gaming can be actually quite helpful and it can promote areas of the brain like the will to want to succeed and the tenacity yeah. to move up levels and things of that nature. And she was highly encouraging that. And I thought, gosh, if we could somehow scale gaming into IT security, wouldn't that be an interesting combination? One of the fun things, and we see this with the capture the flag exercises, uh, is not only are you playing the game to try to beat the game, but creating your own games. Again, nice thing with Minecraft, you create your own scenarios. We see this with the capture of the flags where you create your own environment to try to prevent your enemy coming in. Uh, even on the was it Wii U, most popular game right now is the new one with you create your own Mario levels. So what I've had good success with is getting the kids to learn how to create their own evil images and then allow other kids to learn how to attack them and how to find all of the things wrong with it. Again, in a, a safe playground, we use virtual environments where really there's no way for the student to cause any harm because it's all virtualized. So they can really have the opportunity to be curious and to, to gamify, which kids love just to, to play around. So we're just providing the playground for them. Yeah, I think that's, that's really helpful because even – when my employees go through their their cybersecurity training and taking ethical hacking courses, for them, they come out so excited because they're basically set up uh, sandboxes in which they can mess around and try to beat another team. And, and I think you, they're learning these techniques and learning the mind of the adversary by actually doing it themselves. I find that very, very interesting to see kind of their change of state even coming out of these classes that they're, they're run virtually. Oh, exactly. We're looking for them to gain those problem solvings and solving and critical thinking skills uh, and making it enjoyable. 
Uh, one of the things I advise folks on with the awareness training, there's often two reasons why we do awareness training. One is to change behaviors and to teach, to inform. And unfortunately, the other time sometimes is just to check the box. Have we gone through security awareness training? Check which doesn't necessarily have as much value outside of compliance. So the idea, hopefully, with this type of engagement is to change behaviors, teach the employees something new, and allow them to teach each other and learn new things, again, in a a good, conducive environment. So you, in 2013-14, won the... Cyber Patriot Mentor of the Year. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And so I'd like to know what that means. Like, what is the mechanics of what did you have to do to win that award? That seems it's a fascinating award. I'd love to know from your perspective what, what that entails. Sure. Well, first of all, Cyber Patriot is a nationwide cybersecurity competition, middle school and high schools. There are about 2,000 different teams across the United States, and each team consists of two to five students where they go and they practice on virtual images and then they compete and they compete wherever they are, wherever they're located. So I've been working with local schools in my area with their cybersecurity, their cyber patriot teams. I work with a coach who's a full-time teacher because he really didn't have the computer expertise. I actually contacted him originally five years ago saying, hey, I heard about this, local high school, anything I can do to help? And he's like, oh, thank God. I don't know anything about computers, but I think this is really cool for the kids. So he and I have been partnering for a number of years to reach these high school kids and teach them cybersecurity skills, which include systems and network administration, a little bit of programming, networking. I mean, really, my goal there is just to build the, the concepts and the program of Cyber Patriot to give those kids that safe haven to learn computer technologies and to practice without a fear of doing something wrong uh, in a competitive environment. Because for everything that the students find and fix, they get points. The more points, the better you do. And you can re- uh, ultimately go up to the national competition in Washington, D.C., I've seen numerous students get scholarships and internships through this, which leads to awesome careers. Uh, One of the things I've done that helped me get the Cyber Patriot of the Year is bring in outside speakers. For example, the FBI. Uh, My local FBI is hugely supportive of these types of initiatives, uh, as well as Department of Homeland Security, NSA, including numerous other organizations who have a huge need for more cybersecurity professionals. So they see this as a good way of getting into the classroom early, uh, being able to educate the kids, let them know what they need to know uh, in order to develop a cybersecurity career. It's interesting. I was thinking about how, maybe it was in reading a book recently, I think I mentioned it on the podcast, but at Mark Goodman's uh, book, I'm sure you've read it. Yes, Future Crimes, yes. Yeah. And maybe, I don't. I can't remember if it was mentioned in the book or maybe I heard him on a on a podcast, but... The concept, and I'm sure I'm not the first one to bring this up, but how do you achieve the scale necessary to match the threat that that is out there? Because certainly the scale is bigger than our current business prevention, uh, our current national government's ability to protect ourselves. So it's almost like we need a cyber militia of some sort that can be marshaled together. Have you ever thought about the application of what you're doing from training kids to be able to have a, a, a cyber militia? Oh, definitely. Well, the question I like to ask, and I've asked this of Mike Kaiser, who runs the National Cybersecurity Alliance, as well as numerous others, is how do we get the word about cyber safety out to Joe and Jane public? I mean, the ones who not necessarily are understanding of technology, but they use technology. They buy and sell online. They are beginning to put their devices, home devices, locks, thermostats online. But they, do they know how to protect themselves? The way I see it is looking at the common denominator, which are the kids. So being able to get into the school systems to teach the in-depth technologies as well as online safety. Uh, Just side note that October is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So I'm going to encourage everybody who's listening to please take part. Uh, Because that's actually how we help develop this cyber militia, if you will, is if everybody can do their part and spread the word. If you see someone doing something potentially unsafe online, uh, talking to them about it and letting them know about the potential threats and risks. 
and really they could be saving their own headache. So let me share a, a quick story with you, Bill. My son works for a local McDonald's. Just started there a few months ago. Shortly after he started, he got an email that said, click here, and here is a hyperlink, click here to see your paycheck. So he clicked here and it took him to a web page that said first name blank, last name blank, social security number blank, submit. So he's not necessarily the best in technology, but he knew enough to ask me. So he's like, Dad, can you check this out for me? So I did. So Bill, does that, what, does that sound like a phishing attack to you? Yes, very much. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to say it was actually a legit email. Oh, so, interesting. Yes. So uh, it was the HR company that takes care of human resources for the local McDonald's chain here in Nebraska, where I'm located, sent out an email and had a website that looks very much like phishing. So I contacted the security people for that HR company uh, and informed them that, hey, you know, this could be misleading for people who may not be aware. First of all, they may not be able to legitimately view their paycheck or worse, they will a person know what's legit versus what is not. Uh, so that's the concept we're trying to spread. It's just continually getting the word out. The analogy I like to use, Bill, is uh, car seatbelts. Okay, how long did it take for people to consistently wear car seatbelts after they were invented? Wouldn't you say it would take, it took a couple of decades? Yeah, I would say a couple, of, yeah. We don't necessarily have that much time in the cyber realm. Things are moving way too quickly to gain that level of acceptance. But we have to start now. It took a long time just to get it familiar for everybody to get used to having the idea of a seatbelt. Well, that's what we want to do with, you know, multi-factor authentication, not relying just on the basic passwords anymore, uh, being able to check your credit report on a regular basis here and where your charges are going. And then if something feels suspicious on the internet, to check it out. If you see something, say something. And then the whole idea of Department of Homeland Security, stop, think, connect. But again, Take that second. Uh, don't just go mindless on the internet and blindly click. You know, think about what you're doing and the headache you could be saving will most likely be your own. But I hear what you're saying there, Ron, and I think that one of the biggest disconnects is that our kids are at home and they have, they're using their iPads, they're using computers, and they're using their phones. And we have an industry set up that is populating these app stores with ethically challenged people selling apps that are ripping data off those phones without anybody knowing. The security settings are a, a complete disaster on, on these devices. And parents are coming in from soccer practice and having to police this. And right. where do they start? Like, like mm -hmm. where is the step-by-step, -step, here's what you can do for a safe use and setup of your Droid, a safe use and setup of your iPhone, et cetera? Often the manufacturer sites, if you know where to find it, has some information on that to what to look for. Uh, just being a little bit suspicious. You know, I'm clicking on getting that game, but that it's asking me for access to my contacts list, access to my local Wi-Fi and my location. Um, taking the time to think it through. Again, unfortunately, you are absolutely right. People will blindly click OK just to be able to get that application, not thinking of the potential privacy ramifications. So it's going to be encouraging that normal suspiciousness, but also working with the industry and kind of holding them accountable, holding the application developers accountable for these types of privacy violations. And we kind of see that here with Windows 10. Um, by all accounts, Windows 10 is a very good operating system, except for the privacy settings. One of the things we forget with, and it's not just Microsoft, not gonna pick on them, most large companies, Facebook, the user is the commodity. We are the product on Facebook. I tell folks, I ask the question, you know, let them know that, hey, I heard Facebook is offering a double your money back guarantee for general end users. And then they smile and they think about it, but wait, I don't pay anything. Well, exactly. Um, you are not necessarily Facebook's customer, and Facebook is not alone. Microsoft is very similar. Same things with the application developers. The way they can afford to provide you with an application for 99 cents 
is because the real product they're getting is your information as you log in and use that. Uh, they can begin to, to track behavior patterns to directly market to you. So it's allowing folks to understand the, the ramifications of their behavior and then working with industry and holding them accountable for these types of practices, in my mind. And it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take a long time for us to, to get even close. Yeah, because our discussion over the past two minutes has to do with our own internal companies on U.S. soil violating privacy, which is helping and helping kids understand the privacy implications of the applications they're downloading and the multiple types of communication options they have in their phone. And then we're not even talking about, on the cover of Wall Street Journal, the president having to deal with China on their teams of, of people hacking into U.S. organizations and having to deal with the external threat. So I, I find it interesting, where's the education going to go with the children? Because not everybody's going into the CS, into the computer science area, but those kids that aren't need the education to have kind of a general hygiene. Like right. for us to drink from the cesspool of the internet, <laughs> I mean, literally we have to know where the toilet is in many respects mm -hmm. because we have our own companies that are wanting to rip data to sell to data brokers and we never gave them permission for that. Right, right. Well, that's exactly it, is understanding what are the threats local, you know, domestic and foreign all over. And sometimes those threats are even the people we know. We often see that with identity theft. You know, someone you know is the one who often is the one who, who takes advantage of your identity and your information because of the trust. So how do we enable trust? Because along the internet where we don't always know who we're dealing with, it's often a question I like to ask. It's almost a, an identity paradox. How do we know who we're talking to? For example, you and I have never met in person, Bill. So how do I know you're the real Bill Murphy? How do you know I'm the real Ron Warner? We're having to trust each other. and We need to survive as a society based on that trust. Uh, but it's providing some common authentication mechanisms to be able to build on that trust uh, over time. So it's, it's a conundrum we haven't quite solved yet. As I was looking at some of the organizations that you, when you write on CSO Online and you're having some great education articles on kids and and teaching kids these valuable skills. But I, and I also noticed the team events and these team competitions. Mm -hmm. And I was actually on the sites looking at what these teams look like being an athlete and being and kind of intrigued by how this works. Can you give us a general idea of what a team competition would look like, not only from the children, but maybe from employees that want uh, cybersecurity, people entering the workforce or in, in it for a while that want to participate in a game and sort of boost their, their cybersecurity skills? Certainly. There's many different types of competitions out there. Actually, a, a local bank had one last weekend where they brought in folks just to practice their cybersecurity skills and all levels. Basically, their intent is to try to build their cybersecurity workforce by creating a competition. Uh, so great for even older adults who are trying to get into the cybersecurity workforce because I see a lot of folks who see the need uh, and are looking for career opportunities. So they are moving from other career areas into cybersecurity and we definitely need them. Uh, the way it works as a team is that, well, like any type of team event, you need your leader. Uh, with cybersecurity, we need and to use checklists to secure operating systems, applications, etc. One of the things the teams need to develop is and find is the different checklists. How do I secure? A Windows 10. So if I'm given a bare bones Windows operating system, what steps do I need to do to make sure that it has the right level of security? Uh, the way Cyber Patriot works is that you're given a scenario. And based on that scenario, you need to apply the right types of security policies. You need to make sure the right people are administrators, that any accounts that shouldn't be there are taken away. Uh, looking for hidden types of files, so it does involve some types of forensics, um, being able to set security policies, at least at the local level, because if you learn how to do it locally, you can do it more at a global scale using the different technologies. Um, for Cyber Patriot 2, anything, any tools that the students use need to be freely available online or ones that they write themselves. So it causes them to be curious and look for you know, what is out there that I can use freely and easily available. Um, it's not being blocked by 
Schools Network. Uh, for those who are cybersecurity professionals, if this sounds interesting to you or you just want to build your skills, Cyber Patriot is always looking for more mentors. You don't have to be an expert on this. A great way to learn is to work with a young person and to teach them. Trust me, the high schoolers really don't know very much about it. And even if you have a little bit of IT or cybersecurity skills, it goes a long way in helping out uh, these kids. And it really is a great way for cybersecurity professionals to continually develop their skills. Again, in a very safe environment, uh, and they do provide some of the training as part of it. And then you learn to develop some of your own skills through that. And you say Cyber Patriot is one of the primary ones that you would recommend getting involved in? Yes, yes. Uh, to become a Cyber Patriot mentor, uh, you do need to be vetted. So they do check because you're working with kids, which is awesome idea. Uh, same idea with a lot of the conferences for kids. In my blog, I talk about the Hack for Kids, the Roots Asylum, and then Hack Kids. They're focused on kids. Any adults that work with the kids need to be vetted. Uh, ISC Squared Safe and Secure Online actually provides that vetting process as well. So if you are a member of ISC Squared, uh, you can become a safe and secure online mentor uh, through that. And they give you a lot of the materials directly. So there's a lot of ways uh, security professionals can get involved. Oh, and Bill, there's one nice little benefit to all of this uh, for cybersecurity professionals. It really is that uh, so many of us have a CISSP or a CISA, CISM, or some type of certification that requires the continuing education, uh, CPEs, CEUs, and the like. Being a mentor is an awesome way to get those CPE credits, uh, being able to continually improve yourself while improving someone else. I've talked with the heads of ISACA and ISC Squared, and they are fully on board uh, with this type of idea of getting cybersecurity professionals out there as mentors. Yeah, that's a great idea, being a mentor, because uh, you know it's certainly for the teacher and the taught create the, the teaching, uh, and so that's an interesting, interesting way to grow your own skills and uh, can reinforce what you what you already know. Definitely, is your philosophy that we it has to change at the K through twelve level, or can we pick it up right at the uh, once the kids enter the workforce in their in their twenties? We can pick it up there, or do you feel that we need a combination of both, or where do you see? It definitely being- need a, a combination of both. Uh, to be honest, actually starting earlier because of course the kids are using devices, you know, one and two years old. So really, that's when we can start. Of course, we would need to direct you know, the learning at that point, but developing it even in the high school, because that's often when the interest is initially developed. You know, they begin to think about, what do I want to be when I grow up? You know, what type of career do I want to get into? And many of the kids don't realize all of the opportunities within information technology and cybersecurity. Uh, so be starting there, but we do get a number of uh, professionals who are moving from other types of careers into the field as well. We have that big of a need. Uh, so it's being able to reach out at multiple levels and help uh, professionals learn how to be a cybersecurity or IT or computer science professional. Do you feel that as people go through their careers, is there a way in which you see the kids, and I'd say from an employer's point of view, so someone who's employing IT administrators and such, what is your recommended path from your point of view of taking people in your organization and training them quickly and efficiently? What have you seen works best? Great question. Um, so, Bill, have you? I'm sure you've asked this of question of folks uh, through your podcast. You know, what's the right path to get into cybersecurity? Is there one path? It's kind of an intriguing question to ask. You know, have you gotten into cybersecurity? I took more of the traditional computer science approach. Started as a Unix system administrator, uh, as a prior Air Force intelligence officer. It was just a natural fit for me to get into security. I've already developed the security mindset, and that's really what we're trying to promote, is developing your security mindset. Can you think about threats and vulnerabilities? Identify where they could be, and then learn about the risks. Security is all about risk management. How do we tie it back into the risks? We need to uh, be flexible uh, and take the strengths that the people bring already to the table to be able to build on those. Uh, Now, it takes three things to really make yourself into cybersecurity professional. It takes the education 
which develops the critical thinking. Then there is the experience. One of the top traits of a good cybersecurity professional is maturity uh, because we really need to learn to be tenacious uh, and then not to panic when things don't work the way we want to, being able to work through the issues and troubleshoot. And then the last area is that training and certification, being able to prove that we have the knowledge level and being able to quickly learn new things. Uh, there's always something new to learn in IT and cybersecurity, one of the reasons why I love it. But do you know, have you learned how to learn? Have you learned how you learn best? You know, is it through hands-on? Is it through reading? Is it through having someone teach you? Uh, so looking through your own career I and mean, how can you develop your experience, your education, and then find that training to fill those knowledge gaps. You know, what's interesting is that I see this huge drop off with people that are chasing certifications and really don't have the experience to really offer practical security value. And I was curious, I think, I mean, this is my observation from from looking at what you're doing with uh, with your organizations that you support and your teaching is that the kids that are involved in, in these competitions and really take it, I hate to say a gaming attitude, but are actually practical situation and scenarios outside of the normal day-to-day uh, -day operations. It seems like that's the most, the fastest way to accelerate one's uh, knowledge. Is, am I off base with that? Or, or do you think that that is a kind of Occam's razor approach? <laughs> Somewhat of that Occam's razor approach, definitely. Uh, there are no shortcuts to developing yourself as a professional, first of all. You can't just take a one-week boot camp and call yourself an expert in anything, whether it's cybersecurity or art or finance. Uh, it takes the time. So knowing that you're just going to have to go through the work uh, if you try to take the shortcut, you really are shortchanging yourself and potentially shortchanging your employer. You'll be able to fill a, a potentially short-term gap and you might find and learn things you know, for that the week or two you spend on that training. But it's also then challenging yourself after that training to continually learn that information. Are there new or different ways to work on it and to solve the problem? As you know, on computers, there's always many different ways to solve the issues and identify the risks and different ways to mitigate those risks. So you know, don't allow the, the short term to cloud your long term judgment is the recommendation I make, particularly to, to my younger students. Take the time to do your homework. That's actually something I mentioned to students that tends to depress them. Uh, two things, actually. One is that homework begins once you finish school. And the other is th the real test isn't in the classroom, but out there in the real world. You know, when your boss asks you a question, you can't say, oh, excuse me, let me look up my answer in the book. It's you better be ready with an answer uh, and an intelligent answer and one that fits the needs of your organization. That is a huge point, and I'm glad you made it because when I got my black belt, it was interesting. I was trained by a, a gentleman from Korea who was so highly ranked as a black belt himself. He was probably in his 60s at the time, and he had to go back to Korea to, to find someone that was high enough to actually test him, like he couldn't be tested in the U.S. And he often said, you begin, your training begins when you get your black belt, and there's nine levels beyond that. So it's an interesting point that you made up is that we need a point of entry into the profession, but then it is without a doubt doesn't end. And there's multiple layers to this that lasts a lifetime. So that's a, an interesting point, Bill. Maybe we need some type of a, a ranking system within cybersecurity. You know, as a black belt in cybersecurity, it still shows that I have a long way to go because there's the different levels. But you know, you start out. What do you start out with a white belt, and then? Yeah, it is that way, Ron. And. And what's interesting, and I find it fascinating, the gaming piece, I keep coming back to that because what it sets up is very interesting because even within my soccer team, I coach, I coach a travel soccer team that is an A team, but also we have a B team. And then we also have recreation. We have different levels of recreation. So we can accommodate a girl soccer player at any level. And, and of course, boys as well. But the interesting piece is there's a those that are most skilled and are most deeply attuned to wanting to progress in that sport, it, there's a channel for them. And, and I think it was funny. I was just on, again, one of the sites that linked off of your, of your writing. It was essentially, it looked like the NCAA basketball bracket for cybersecurity competitions. And I was like, this is great because like any employer can patch their administrator that's just out of college 
Maybe they don't even have a specialist background, but it says, I want to be a security professional. No problem. This is one of the avenues you can go in and, and maybe yes. apply, apply for one of these competitions. And maybe, you, again, you're at the recreation level and have no desire to be at the black belt level, but it looks like it's a team of 8 to 10, 12 people, yes. correct? Yes, and that's the NCCDC, the National Cybersecurity Defense Competition, uh, and that's at the collegiate level where they practice these, and again, in a kind of a, a gaming type of environment, learning how to secure operating systems, and you can go in at almost every level. Uh, one of the things that we're watching out for is to make sure we're not becoming too elite with all of these, because then there almost creates too much of a barrier to entry. We want to let folks know that, hey, it's okay to be a newbie with this. We all had to be noobs at one point. And that's fine as long as you're actively engaged in your learning uh, is really the type. So to, to get involved at whatever layer or level you're at to engage in these types. Um, the person I want to introduce you to is uh, Dr. Dan Manson out of Cal State Pomona in California who runs the Cybersecurity Competition Federation, so CyberFed, where it's looking at all of these different cybersecurity competitions and creating a single site for information. Uh, he has an awesome vision on how to create a sport out of cybersecurity competitions uh, where you know, we could almost, and actually one of the big things on the internet now is watching other people play video games. Huge, huge. Yeah, yeah, we exactly. Can incorporate that within cybersecurity. Uh, so check out the Cybersecurity Competition Federation. I believe it's cyberfed.org. Another question for you, Ron, re related to this concept of the dark side of influence. Mm -hmm. I, I was intrigued by a presentation sample you sent to me about, you called it being under the influence, but then as I was reading through it, I thought, gosh, this is really interesting. Maybe you could explain for the audience what you mean by the dark side of influence and what your philosophy is on it. Of course. Thank you. One of the things, and if you talk to some of the security pundits like Marcus Random and Bruce Schneier, even though they're extremely gifted technically, they both came independently to the same conclusion that people will always be the weakest link in security. There's always going to be a way around encryption due to that human element. We're going to need to decrypt at some point so humans can process and take advantage of the information. That's something Bruce Schneier has written a lot about. So the idea is understanding how humans can be manipulated. I use the catchphrase unfluence, kind of like influence, but in a negative way. And we don't even realize how often we are being influenced one way or the other. Again, we see this online where we want to, we want that game, we want that application, so we don't care if we're giving up our privacy for it, not even realizing we've just given up uh, some important piece of ourselves, our information, uh, in exchange for what we perceive to be free. Because, of course, free isn't necessarily free. So through this talk, I go through the different ways that uh, the malicious influencers are trying to gain access to our information and our systems. I use Robert Cialdini, he's Dr. Robert Cialdini, who wrote a book on influence, The Art of Persuasion, along with Chris Hadnagy's book on social engineering. For example, likability. If you like something or somebody, you're more willing to trust them. Well, so the malicious people take advantage of that. Um, scarcity rule is another one if I make something appear to be scarce. Like you go out to buy tickets to fly. You'll always see at most sites now, you know, only two tickets left at this price. Trying to get you, trick you into thinking that it's a scarce commodity. When in reality, it may not be. Uh, so there's numerous rules associated with this. Uh, also go through other art of it uh, called elicitation, how to find information from people. Uh, by asking questions or just getting them to talk. Uh, it's amazing the information that people will leak just through a common conversation. You know, they'll let you know all about their situation, their family, their organization. Uh, one of the best ways I like of infiltrating an organization is I go to a local restaurant or watering hole near the company headquarters. And I just listen into the conversations. Uh, so it, a lot of it ties back to what's known in the military sense called OPSEC, operation security, which isn't necessarily taught uh, in the business place and probably should be. I never heard this presented this way or talked about this way. And what was really important is it seemed to me a lot like NLP, neuro linguistic programming, and even in a little bit of hypnosis and the way that you could lead someone 
persuade someone just by the use of language, by the use of of gesture. I, I was just listening to a podcast yesterday with Scott Adams. The he you know created the uh, the Dilbert uh, cartoon, and what was interesting is he talked about how he used hypnosis in a lot of his writing and mm-hmm. a lot of his cartoons to lead people. And I thought, gosh, when I started listening to what you're saying, it seems to me a lot about leading people to conclusions. Do you think people are doing that intentionally or do you think it's just because they're being surreptitious? Yes, uh, all of the above. Having heard Scott Adams talk, uh, he made the pointy-haired boss with the hair on purpose to kind of make the boss look devilish, if you will, <laughs> right. to, to change our thinking. So this way we all can identify easily with that person. Uh, Dilbert is kind of that everyman type of approach that, again, everybody can identify with. It's done both, um, marketers, salespeople. One of my favorite social engineering books, by the way, is How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie which was written in the 1940s. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, absolutely. You take off your, your white hat and you put on a black hat. It's a great book on how to manipulate people uh, through compliments. I, and Cialdini talks about this. You start out with a compliment. You pretty much pwn almost anybody you talk with. It's just a very easy way to do it. And I try to do it not in a, a mean approach, but as a way to connect with people because uh, I like connecting with people in a positive manner, uh, but just being aware of it. Uh, the nice thing with this, Bill, is I've used these techniques to help me when I bought a car, because you can watch car salesmen try to use these, uh, and you can see right through them when you learn these techniques and use it to to improve the types of deals you get. Absolutely. It's interesting how you've talked about this from the, from the security point of view, even talking about the rules of embedded commands in your voice to be aware of being on the receiving end of someone using embedded commands like you act now or you must do this or I need your password right now. Things like this. Make a great point. I just did it right there. <laughs> <laughs> very good. So, so that's uh, very interesting. I, I've never seen that, uh, that approach to, do you actually uh, mention that with your students when you're teaching them? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. We we go through a lot of these techniques. So they are aware and it's just mind opening to them because they don't realize how they could be manipulated and then how to break the chain. So when you think I could be manipulated, actually, there's a very easy solution to this is to just ask somebody else, take a step out. It's the stop, think, connect idea to break the chain. So you get a phone call and you're not sure if it's really from your bank or not. Say, okay, tell you what, I'm going to call you back. Or you ask a trusted colleague, hey, I just saw this or heard this. You know, this email looks suspicious. What do you think? Those, that little step really goes a long way in protecting yourself. The person doesn't have to be an expert on social engineering or manipulation. Just getting someone else's viewpoint and gives you a chance to stop and think about what you are doing breaks that, the cyber kill chain, if you will. So just as, as we wrap up, Ron, over the next couple of minutes, I, I'm curious, I have a couple other questions for you. And one of them is an interesting one. If you had a billboard and you can put it in any major city in the United States, or let's say one major city in all 50 states, and it was your billboard, you could say whatever you want to say, what would you put on that billboard? <laughs> that is an awesome, awesome question. <laughs> well, to start, uh, immediate need... Next week in Anaheim, California, is the As Is and ISC Squared uh, conference. So I probably put one right there in front of the Anaheim Convention Center, uh, encouraging security professionals to step out and be a mentor. Find someone who is junior to you to help them out. Uh, Spread the word about how to keep yourself safe. Get out into your community about safety and security. I think that'll help make a huge difference. And I would do that for every major uh, conference and every minor conference. Put it you know, where the attendees go. Because one of the things I've learned as an educator and why I love being a teacher is that's really how I learn. I learn by teaching others. And I think I'm pretty common that way. You really get into a topic when you have to instruct someone else how to do it. Uh, so to find someone who you can mentor. And there's, there are those people out there. There are a lot of people hungry for mentors. And again, you don't have to be a guru or an expert. Just 
somewhat knowledgeable and it goes a long way. Well, it's a great way to skip steps and it's a great way. I don't mean to belittle the process of, of <laughs> learning, but sometimes people want to go fast in some areas. And if right. they can find a mentor that has 10, like you're a teacher, but you have a complete, this grounded base in programming and theory and, and raw, getting it done, rolling up your sleeves point of view. That's a very different type. Uh, and if someone needed that type of grounding for, as a mentor, that would be searching you out would be incredibly smart. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, and if they wanted to find someone with a different set of skills, finding a mentor would be a huge, so I think it's a great recommendation and it's an interesting billboard to have for sure. One of the other questions I have is if you from all the books that you've gifted through the years, and it doesn't have to be cybersecurity related, it could be whatever you have uh, really thought was a, a good book. What What is your favorite books that you've gifted through the years or book? The, the one I've done most recently, I've been doing this over the years, is The One Minute Manager by Ken Blanchard and Dr. Spencer Johnson, uh, originally written what, in the 1980s. Basically a three-step approach to management, uh, and they take it all in one minute chunks. So really easily done. A one minute goal setting, a one minute uh, where you look for areas of opportunity, and then the one minute uh, success where you find where people have done well. So often in cybersecurity, we in audit, you, you, we're looking for things people do wrong. You know, that's what we're looking for. You know, how did you not do what you needed to do to be secure or not meet the compliance goals? Uh, we forget to take that step to catch people doing things right. It's actually part of that influence techniques because uh, then people really do embrace what you're saying a lot better when you're bringing up areas of opportunity. And then the one minute goal setting is so people know where, where are we trying to go and we work and collaborate together. So really I would recommend everyone pick up the one minute manager. It's actually got a new title called the new one minute manager uh, recently updated. Uh, so check it out. Uh, you can find a lot of information about it online. That is a great book. It's a it's a classic. Thanks for that recommendation and that reminder. So I know you mentioned early on that health and well-being within the profession, I think, sometimes gets ignored because there's so much uh, stress and so much pressure and a lot of 24 by 7 requirements for a lot of cybersecurity professionals and and CIOs that are that are running their shops and having to do double duty as the, as the CISO. What would you recommend is a good, healthy structure for working out, eating, things of that nature that would be good for, for people just to kind of pay attention to? First of all, get out of your chair. It's actually one of the things I recommend in how to develop your people skills. And it's good for well-being as well. Sometimes we forget, and that's why I like these new smartwatches that'll remind you that, hey, silly, you've been sitting there for an hour and haven't moved. Get up and stretch. Those little steps go a long way. Also getting out of your chair to answer someone's email. Uh, to see them and meet them face to face. That goes a great way in terms of connecting. A resource I highly recommend uh, listeners check out is uh, Mike Rothman and uh, Jennifer Gablish did a talk at RSA a couple of years ago called Taming Your Inner Curmudgeon. Uh, Taming Your Inner Curmudgeon by Mike Rothman and JJ X is how she goes. Uh, talks about uh, using uh, yoga uh, and using meditation as a way to encourage well-being. So check it out. Both of them are consummate cybersecurity professionals, very esteemed in their field. I never would have guessed they would have come up with this, uh, and they did, and it is great uh, ideas that we could all live by. It's interesting because it, you recommended the book. It's so easy to be negative. The One Minute Manager uh, is one the, noticing something that's going right because there, you know, the, the science around that is actually pretty powerful. If someone's heard you do uh, notice something that they're doing right, they're more inclined to continue to do something right. And then when you mentioned uh, the yoga and the and the meditation, it's interesting how our brains get so fight or flight because we're essentially battling in many respects or learning how to battle that it really triggers a completely a primitive brain structure. And yep. that yoga and that meditation is fantastic for kind of rebalancing the brain uh, in a very powerful way. So I'll have to research that. And it was interesting, RSA this year had a guy, only one out of maybe a thousand mm -hmm. sessions, but one guy that was dedicated to kind of yoga and just, uh, you know, some practices of that nature. But it was, he was, it was an interesting talk. Right. No, I think that's an important point that we sometimes get wrapped around what we're looking at and too, too pigeonholed 
So to expand our perspective, I think, is a great uh, trait we need as cybersecurity professionals. Well, I want to uh, thank you, Ron, for those final three points related to the, the billboard of the mentoring and the, and the book recommendation and the importance of healthy living. Um, is there any asks that you have of the audience listening or anything that you, any ways that you want people to, that it can go to find you online? I'm certainly going to link up on the show notes mm-hmm. ways for people to kind of find your writing and maybe connect with you via Twitter or LinkedIn. But do you have any specific asks from the audience? Uh, well, first of all, please reach out to your local community and spread the word about cyber safety, cyber security. Uh, little steps go a long way. Uh, and that'll help grow the whole community and ensure we're all safe and secure online. Uh, you can check out my blog on CSO. It is called Educating Next Gen Cybersecurity Professionals. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm Ron W123. Uh, and I only tweet things that are professional, security, or education related. Uh, so I try to make sure all of my tweets have value um, because I do have folks following me from 15 to 65. So I want to make sure I'm continually adding value uh, over Twitter or within the blog. Uh, If you have questions, please reach out. I love connecting with people and answering questions and seeing what we can do to better work together to promote cyber safety and cybersecurity. Well, this is great, Ron. I want to thank you and uh, we'll have to do a round two at some point in the future. Oh, definitely. Definitely. It's always fun. Have a great day, Ron. Thanks. You too. I hope you enjoyed listening to today's program with Ron Werner. If you're a CIO and you're just looking to build a security team or a CISO doing the same or a parent, I really learned a lot about the ways in which cybersecurity skills are being taught, examples of games, also the top three skills of a cybersecurity professional, books and recommendations, and also the importance of not panicking. I think this is important. I just listened to a podcast recently on how the SEALs The Navy SEALs are trained not to panic in crisis situations. So when they go into firefights, it is not the first time that their systems and their body and their mind has been stressed and put to the test. And I think it's important for the profession that we develop people who do not have to panic in the face of situations that seem very stressful from the book knowledge point of view, but developing those real world skills and in a team competition environment, in a simulated games, this is very important. So I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. And if you did, please go to iTunes and leave comments and feedback there. That is really important to me. So I hope that you can do that. It would really help support the show. In addition, if you like to reach out to me via LinkedIn or on Twitter, feel free to do that at Red Zone CIO on Twitter. And then on LinkedIn, you can reach me through direct messaging on that platform. Thank you very much, everybody, and look forward to seeing you on episode number 27. So there you have it. This wraps another episode of Bill Murphy's Red Zone podcast. To get all the relevant show notes, please go to our blog at www.redzonetech.net forward slash podcast. Additionally, make sure you go to iTunes and leave your comments in iTunes about the show. This helps our show rankings enormously and it helps support the show. Until next time, I appreciate you very much for listening. Thank you.